Hello, and welcome to the Health Essentials Podcast, brought to you by Cleveland Clinic. I'm your host, Nada Youssef. If you're looking for easy ways to improve you and your family's health this winter season, this podcast is for you. We will be discussing what foods nourish the body and mind during this cold winter season. Here to help us get smarter about seasonal eating is Maxine Smith. She's a registered dietitian in Cleveland Clinic's Digestive Disease and Surgery Institute. Welcome, Maxine. Good to be here, Nada. Thank you. Thanks so much for being here again. And for our viewers and listeners, please remember this is for informational purposes only, and it's not intended to replace your own physician's advice. Okay, Maxine, so what does eating seasonally mean, and why is it so important? When I first think about seasonal eating, I think what foods are available in these at any particular time of the year. Uh, at this time of the year, we're thinking about what's available uh, after possibly a frost. What what is hardy? What uh, can survive a frost? But it really means so much more than that because seasons also are related to different lifestyles. Uh, for example, over the holidays or the winter months, kids might be home from college. You might have visitors, so you might have larger family gatherings that are going to affect how you eat. It's also affected by uh, culture and ethnicity. So seasonal eating for me, being from Eastern European descent, might be more preserved foods, more fermented foods like sauerkraut, uh, more um, pork or uh, uh, meat that are more readily available in that grazing animals. Whereas somebody from a, uh, a Mediterranean area, it may mean more seafood on special occasions. Uh, so we need to take that uh, definition of just what's available uh, to and put it in a broader context. Also, uh, because of packaging and transportation advances, we have so much available to us now, which might not have been available available at one point of time, but has affected our cultures and traditions. So taking that and applying it to the winter season, what foods should we be looking to buy? There are uh, some great nutrient powerhouses out there right now. And it's interesting because many of the foods that are hardy and can survive a frost are loaded with nutrients possibly because they've had to be survivors themselves and uh, uh, against the ravages of the of weather and insects and so forth that they uh, can transfer those same properties to us. Uh, many of these um, um, foods are, are packed with uh, different nutrients and you're going to be looking at uh, many of the root vegetables. So whether it's um, carrots, potatoes, onions, um, garlic, some different uh, um, bulb vegetables. Also greens, many greens are very um, versatile. So you'll have greens that are available really early in the planting season to uh, an extended planting season. Um, you're also, uh, many of the cruciferous vegetables that uh, have uh, the peppery uh, taste to them, the strong sulfur taste in some cases, uh, that such as uh, Brussels sprouts and cabbage, uh, red cabbage, uh, broccoli, um, all of these uh, are nutrition uh, powerhouses too, um, offering uh, vitamins uh, such as A and C, which are great for immunity, uh, vitamin K, um, magnesium, uh, manganese, all these things also uh, transfer to heart health, brain health, bone health, uh, all the different plant nutrients. Uh, looking for colors such as in beets, uh, you get uh, things like anthocyanin. So many of these plant nutrients are defined by these colorful compounds that you can find in some of these foods. Sounds delicious. <laughs> now, obviously, soup is a winter staple. Many of us resort to store-bought cans. So can you give us maybe some tips on how to make soup from scratch that's satisfying and contain these winter vegetables? 
That's a great way to get in all these nutrients. I like to think of it as taking that summer salad or the summer bowl and with all the different vegetables and making a soup out of them. Uh, so whereas a cold salad might not be very enticing in the winter, a nice hot bowl of soup may be. And, uh, and some soups have also been shown to be therapeutic as far as helping to alleviate cold symptoms and uh, de uh, acting as a decongestant and whatnot. Uh, and yes, uh, homemade soup and store-bought soup, once you, uh, once you make your own, there's no going back. Um, you can make it so much more nutritious. You have so much more control over how much sodium you put in there. Uh, you can really enhance it with lots of the anti-inflammatory herbs and spices also that are warm and soothing um, uh, for the palate in this season. And it, it really is so simple. You can uh, take shortcuts, yes, but you can make a very simple broth by just poaching a couple pieces of chicken, such as a chick, you take a couple chicken breasts, poach it in water, uh, and uh, you have a basic broth. Now, to, to make a really good soup, you wanna caramelize some of those uh, vegetables. So what's referred to as mirepoix, or in French, uh, excuse my French, uh, in my accent, but, um, so, um, or some people will call it a version of the Holy Trinity. So you have your uh, onions, you have your carrots and you have your celery and you chop it up finely and you want those to cook on a very low temperature for quite a long time until the sweetness comes out. So you want those to caramelize and that's going to add so much flavor to that base. Uh, and then uh, you can, um, after that is caramelized, add the garlic. You don't want to add the garlic too soon because burnt garlic can ruin an entire dish. So it only takes a couple minutes for that to, uh, to, that to happen. And then you want to add all your herbs. You want to cook those just a little bit until you can smell the fragrance in them because the, when they're cooked in a little bit of fat, you can put these uh, vegetables and herbs and a little bit of olive oil instead of butter or avocado oil to make it healthier. And when you're cooking those herbs in that oil, it's going to bring out the depth and the flavor of those herbs rather than throwing them in there later. Uh, tomatoes, especially for uh, meat soups, uh, would be the next addition. And again, if you cook those for a period of time, they're going to caramelize and that sweetness is going to come out. Um, and then as far as the meat, you can go from anything from chicken to fish to uh, lean beef, um, lamb, really it's up to you what you put in there. Uh, and it really doesn't take long for that to cook. You can make a, a, a soup in half an hour to 45 minutes. Um, crock pots are great um, because uh, the flavor just can meld over a longer period of time. Uh, some people even choose to make their own bone broth using a, a crock pot. If you want a, a more gelatinous, rich, thick broth. And you can always take the shortcuts too and buy the uh, either frozen or store-bought broth. Uh, one thing you wanna make sure is get the broth, not the stock for soups. For the longest time, I didn't know the difference, but uh, mm -hmm. a broth is a more well-rounded, flavored, um, substance, whereas a stock that's good for soups, you can even just drink it as it is. But a stock is more of something that you would use as a foundation for a sauce or a gravy that would go well with meat. Excellent. And during the winter season, and with many people still working from home, and even maybe kids, you know, doing school from home now, uh, crab pot or slow cooker seems the way to go. And, you know, a lot of times we'll just put our vegetables there, we'll sit all day, it'll simmer, we'll smell it. What I'm wondering, it, do, it does not lose its nutritious benefits cooking in the slow cooker for a long time. This is still keeps it nice and healthy, nutritious for us. Yes, it absolutely does. And actually, low temperature cooking retains many of the nutrients. And some nutrients are definitely lost in fluid, 
But the advantage of soup is that we're recapturing those because we're not tossing out the fluid. Um, and the other thing to um, can add to that too is some type of whole grain. Uh, so this could be um, quinoa or it could be whole wheat uh, couscous. Um, it could be brown rice, uh, whatever it may be, um, a whole wheat noodle or an edamame noodle. Now, sometimes if you put these right in the soup, they can take over the soup. And before you know it, you have this uh, extremely thick, uh, more mm -hmm. like uh, stew consistency. So sometimes making those on the side and then adding those as desired at the end uh, is an option. Beans are another uh, great uh, nutrient that you can add to the soup. It would add some protein, some fiber, and it can also add some thickness. Now, if you were using a, a dry bean, you would need to soak those first overnight. Um, so they're soft and then cook them first, especially if you have something acid. I've made that mistake. I've thrown them into the soup with some tomatoes and they stay hard. Uh, so uh, yeah, that you want to consider. Lentils have the advantage that you don't have to soak them first. So lentils are a legume you could just take and toss right in there. Good, sounds good. So soup and chili even sounds perfect for this kind of weather. Um, so during these gray cold months, our bodies are lacking a lot of uh, vitamin D, uh, especially living in Cleveland, Ohio, um, and the sunshine that goes with it. Are there any special good mood foods or foods that maybe contain vitamin D that we should consider this season? Uh, vitamin D is found in few and far between foods. But most abundant source is in the sunshine. Uh, so in lieu of going to the beach, uh, there are a few foods uh, that we can get vitamin D from. Fish is uh, one of the most abundant sources, but not any fish. It's going to be uh, the fatty cold water fishes, which makes sense because vitamin D uh, is a fat soluble vitamin. Uh, these, uh, some of these fishes are the same that are rich in the omega-3 fats, which you may have heard about, and that are also good for uh, brain health and heart health, and uh, such as salmon, tuna, mackerel, sea bass, uh, trout, and uh, my, one of my new favorites is barramundi, uh, which is an Australian fish. Uh, other sources are going to be uh, deer, uh, vitamin D fortified dairy products. Milk is a very good source of, of vitamin D. Cheese, on the other hand, is not going to uh, contain much vitamin D. Uh, some mushrooms are being created that under UV lights where they are uh, designed to be rich in vitamin D. Again, those might be a little bit hard to find at this point of time. That's very interesting about the mushrooms. I didn't know about that fact. Um, can we talk a little bit about the fatty fishes? Um, you know, we don't live next to an ocean. Where is the best, what is the best way to get our fish? And also uh, you hear about like salmon, there's uh, wild caught versus farm raised, what that means and what we should strive for getting. Yeah, so uh, there are a few options. Uh, many uh, grocery stores uh, will ship in fish on a regular basis. So that's an important thing to ask is how often do you ship in your fish, whether it's from Florida or the coast of Alaska or even overseas. Some uh, stores may be shipping in fish almost every day of the week. So ask them, what did, what did you get in today? Because you want a fish that is fresh, uh, that doesn't have an odor uh, for the best quality and taste. Uh, another option um, is to get flash frozen fish that is vacuum sealed, uh, vacuum sealed in individual container, in, in individual packages um, is highly nutritious and because of advanced uh, packaging techniques that it seals in the flavor and the moisture and prevents crystals forming, which can really deteriorate a fish. Uh, the nice thing about the individually portioned fishes is that uh, you can easily thaw them by just putting them in a big bowl of cool water. So in, say, 20 minutes or so, 
uh, the fish can be defrosted and ready to cook. Great. And then should we go for the wild caught or the farm uh, raised? And what is the difference? Now, if you have a choice and the availability, uh, definitely go with the wild caught fish. It's going to be, and really the difference is going to, the main difference is going to come down to the feed. So uh, they're going, the wild fish, of course, is going to be uh, naturally fed, uh, eating the smaller fishes and other microorganisms, which can uh, contribute to a more nutritious fish, a less inflammatory fish, more omega-3s, and uh, that fish is getting more activity. It's going to typically be lower in saturated fat. When you get a farm-raised fish, uh, the quality is going to depend on the feed. Uh, the feed may, even though it's getting better and techniques are getting better, may have some pro-inflammatory compounds in that feed. And they tend to be uh, fattier. And you think of a marbleized steak as being fatty. And if you ever looked at some of the, uh, say, salmon in the store, it has that same marbleized look. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, a wild fish, you're not going to see that marbleized fat in there. Uh, so not only can red meat uh, be high in saturated fat, which isn't good for your heart, but even a raw marbleized salmon can, it can be the same. And then there's, all, of course, environmental concerns and how, uh, how many of these fishes are escaping in, in, uh, outside of the farmed community and how is this feed that's going into the water affecting other wild fish. So there are uh, environmental concerns as well. Great. Now we know uh, people tend to gain some weight during the fall and the winter holidays, uh, but dieting during this time can be very, very tough, especially with a lot of good food around. Um, what do you suggest? What diet is ideal for this time of year? So I would suggest the MDD diet. So MDD, I bet you haven't heard of that one. Is it uh, the <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> so the I would say uh, minimize damage diet, <laughs> yes, um, or more seriously, maintain daily diet. So this is not the time to radically transform your diet. There are there, you want uh, to be in a relatively low stress situation. Uh, a time period when you're going to make radical changes and even making radical changes period, I would not suggest uh, unless you're setting yourself up for failure. Um, but probably if you think about it, you know, what have I, what have I, what good habits have I developed throughout the year? Um, maybe I have introduced more vegetables into my diet. Maybe I have cut out snacking. Um, mm -hmm between meals or at night. So how can I maintain these good habits during this time uh, that I've developed? And then um, possibly, at a, it's like decorating a Christmas tree. You know, I have this foundation that I've established and then I'm gonna add a couple of ornaments or a couple of accoutrements to that, um, but in small doses and for a temporary amount of time. Um, uh, um, so rather than looking at, at uh, transforming things, how can I maintain what I've done? I heard some wise person say, it, it could take months to establish a new habit. How long does it take to, for, uh, to rekindle those old fires of old habits? Eh, about two days. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't uh, say whether that's an exact time frame, but I think we can all testify to the point that it does not take long to revert to old habits. That's very true. Okay, well, speaking of habits, there will be a lot of cooking happening this uh, holiday season. How do we reclaim our kitchen, make sure we're serving healthy choices, sticking to our habits, uh, you know, for with our family or friends all around us? Yes. Um, so uh, first of all, yeah, controlling the environment is extremely important. Um, so what you have available, what you have in front of you on the counter, 
in, uh, visually is going to have a great impact on what we choose. We don't want to overestimate willpower. Uh, that will only take us so far. And it is compromised by stresses of the season. Uh, it's compromised by sleep deprivation, which may be an obstacle at this time. Uh, uh, pressures of uh, family members and food pressures and all these other things. So if we keep that uh, base that I was uh, referring to that you've established um, as a foundation, uh, it, that's a good place to start. Um, as far as trying to make things healthier, uh, uh, as far as um, controlling the environment, there's different ways to do that. And I like to think of um, PI just as an acronym. Um, so um, PI, uh, the first the P would stand for there's different ways to make foods either healthier. You have to think of what your goals are. Healthier, cut calories. Your goal may not be to lose weight in the long run. It may be just to maintain a healthy weight, but maybe your cholesterol was high and you're trying to avoid taking a cholesterol pill. So you want to keep the fat content down, not the calorie content, or the, rather the saturated fat content or the animal fat content down. Um, and you're not so concerned about calories. If you have diabetes, you might be more concerned about um, the sugar content of foods over the holidays. So you, you want to establish uh, your goal to begin with. Um, that will then dictate some of those decisions that you made in the kit, make in the kitchen. Um, but the pie, um, there's different ways you can intervene to make foods healthier or lower in calories. So, um, PE for portions. So, yeah, you can uh, slice that pie in six pieces or you can slice that pie in 10 pieces, uh, ha having a smaller sliver of it and eat mindfully. Um, that could be very satisfying. Um, the, the I is for ingredients. So, how are, are there ingredients that I can change? How can I um, decrease the sugar content? How can I decrease um, the animal fat content? Um, it could be decreasing that uh, ingredient altogether or substituting it with another alternative such as avocado oil for butter in a recipe or um, um, uh, you know, some uh, uh, stevia or monk fruit for some of the sugar in that, um, in that product. Um, I is just change everything about it. Uh, sometimes making those substitutions isn't going to cut. Uh, <laughs> you're still going to want the original version. So just thinking of something totally different. And what are some of, what are some of those foods that you already have around that are healthy? And how can you make them a little special? Such as, okay, I don't want to eat the apple pie. So because of the sugar, so I'm going to make a, a crack pot. Um, roasted uh, baked apple and uh, put a little bit of um, cinnamon and nutmeg and some spices on there and uh, maybe just a dash of brown sugar mm -hmm. and then put a dollop of uh, uh, instead of ice cream or something like that you put on there put a little dollop of greek yogurt and then some toasted crumbled walnuts on top I'm getting very hungry talking about that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's something just totally different, but may give you that same um, sense of warmth and comfort and uh, spiciness that you're craving. Hmm. Now, I, I've been hearing a lot about mindful eating. It's become quite popular. Can you tell us what is mindful eating and how to incorporate my, mindful eating this holiday? Yes, um, I, I'm passionate about it um, because so many times we focus on the why we, what we, when we, but we don't really think um, about the why we eat or the how we eat. And it uh, can be truly a truly transforming practice um, so that you can really savor and appreciate foods even more but in small quantities. So, so many people tell me, 
oh no, I'm going to the dietitian. I I like to eat. I like food. I, was like, I do too. <laughs> that, that would really be a bummer if yeah. So I was going to tell you, yes, don't eat delicious food. <laughs> Um, so, uh, mindful eating is a way to actually enjoy our foods more, um, but to, uh, don't have the regret and the guilt and the negative uh, ramifications afterwards. Um, the thing is that mindful eating um, focuses uh, on uh, some practices of mindfulness, which is an ancient practice which uh, has been applied to many things today, but it's um, really um, being in the moment, so tuning out distractions, um, focusing on our food in this case, uh, and uh, with the intent, uh, so it's an intent to uh, identify the different sensory qualities of that food and uh, savor it. Uh, it's a non-judgmental in its approach, so it's not labeling foods as good or bad. So uh, you're not inflicting shame upon yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you're also thinking about the costs and benefits of the food choice. How are you going to feel after you eat this food? Is it going to be an energy giving food or an energy draining food? So uh, I ha can do the things that I um, enjoy either in the short term or the long term. Uh, so, um, but the time to practice is not at that holiday dinner. Uh, because it is a practice, and just like exercising your muscles to build that skill uh, for that sporting event, uh, it's something that you can practice um, over time, and it will uh, make it can make a significant difference. Then, when you are put in a position of more pressure and stress and distraction. Excellent. And I, I will try to incorporate mindful eating in, in my next big meals because I, I find that eating fast seems to not be mindful and to maybe slow down and, you know, chew it and taste it before just, you know, getting to the bottom of the bowl and makes me eat more. So uh, that's very good information. Yes, and that, that's a good point. And sometimes, I don't know if you've ever cooked a, a big meal and say a Thanksgiving meal for a big crowd and by the time you sit down, do you want to eat it? Often, mm -hmm. no, because you've smelled it, you've touched it, you've uh, uh, you know explored the textures, uh, all these other aspects, and uh, um, essentially, you've been uh, fulfilled by that. So it is a good way to uh, extract benefits without the calories. So moving on to drinks, can you share some of your tips for holiday drinks that are delicious, nutritious, and definitely keeping us still healthy? Yes, drinks are a very important thing because uh, they can really pack in a lot of calories, they can have a lot of alcohol that can give us undesired effects such as zapping our energy or giving us poor judgment. And uh, the thing about drinks is uh, our body doesn't register the calories like they do solid food. And also when we're standing, which we're often doing when we're having a drink, our uh, bodies don't register that we've consumed the calories that we've actually consumed also. Uh, so, and you may want to uh, save the calories for that piece of special pie that somebody made rather than drinking those calories. Uh, so thinking uh, of very simple beverages, uh, so having a sparkling flavored water might be an option with a twist of lime or lemon. Uh, if you do add some alcohol, uh, measure it out uh, because uh, just a, a pour, we tend to overestimate how much we're consuming. Uh, if you uh, wanted to add a little calories but some nutrition to a drink and you're considering an alcoholic drink it might be something like a bloody mary uh made and if you're watching your salt maybe even using a low sodium tomato juice so you're actually getting some nutrients out of there at the same time or it could be a um a screwdriver that is made uh with uh some diluted uh uh orange juice where you're diluting it with some 
sparkling water and adding a bit of fizz to it. When you get into some of the uh, sugary drinks, when you're talking about margaritas and daiquiris, uh, you're, you're getting into a lot of calories. And the same thing with creamy drinks. If you're having a, a shot of alcohol versus a shot of Bailey's, which is creamy, you're talking about a lot more calories. Uh, even things like coffee drinks can uh, add a tremendous amount of calories. So if you're picking up a um, pumpkin latte, for example, and you have in there uh, literally um, five plus shots of sugary syrup, and uh, you've exceeded your uh, sugar uh, allotment for the entire day. And then you add uh, the sweetened whipped cream to it. Uh, you, you pack on even more calories. Um, you can slash that by going to a smaller size, or you can, again, uh, change uh, the ingredients altogether. So you can get the whip, uh, go with a almond milk, and uh, and maybe reduce the uh, shots of the syrup to uh, two instead of uh, the five that may be in there. And you've even significantly slashed calories um, even more by about 50%. Um, if you want to, uh, if you're just passing time and you want something warm to um, get you through the day, you might even want to consider just a chai tea bag with some whipped almond milk in there. And instead of a sugary chai tea latte, which may sound healthy, but it really packs on the galleries. In addition to some of the beverages I mentioned, there are some that uh, can actually be therapeutic because they have are made from anti-inflammatory components or that they can have pain alleviating qualities. Uh, some of the, one of my favorites is making a warm golden milk, and you can find many recipes online for this. The basic ingredient is um, turmeric. Um, so uh, turmeric, I add ginger to my cinnamon, cardamom, which is my favorite spice, um, and it's important to add a little bit of ground pepper. Uh, so the pepper will help with the absorption of the turmeric. Uh, I make up a big batch of this so it's all ready and uh, you can add it to a warm milk you can order add it to a milk uh, substitute such as almond milk if you're trying to keep the calories down on sweetened almond milk uh, whisking in a little bit of fat even a teaspoon of avocado oil it might sound gross but it actually just causes makes it creamy and helps with the absorption of the turmeric it's a very soothing uh, evening uh, pre-bedtime drink. Uh, there are also uh, teas. I keep them on hand for somebody who has a sore throat in the winter, uh, but that are made from licorice, that are made from uh, slippery elm. So these components of the teas uh, can uh, have a soothing effect on the throat, alleviate um, pain, whether it's a Rote coat tea or licorice tea, um, chai teas have things like uh, cloves and ginger, uh, which also have uh, immune enhancing and anti inflammatory properties. Uh, another favorite is I keep these uh, uh, mulling spices, which have um, beautiful star anise and uh, cloves and nutmeg, uh, cinnamon all these great spices on hand. And uh, you can uh, simmer those in teas, you can simmer those in uh, uh, apple cider, um, and uh, if you're having an alcoholic drink in a uh, um, dry red wine, along with uh, some fruits such as oranges, uh, other citrus uh, seasonal fruits. Uh, and uh, so not only do they add to the comfort, but uh, appeal because of the warmth, but they're also therapeutic at the same time. That's great. And I know you mentioned a little bit about uh, alcohol in there, and that was going to be my next question, because most likely inevitable alcohol will be in the upcoming holiday gatherings. 
Um, what I think I heard you say is instead of doing kind of like a pre-made alcoholic drink, it's better to kind of start it from scratch so you know what you're putting in there, how much alcohol, what kind of alcohol, and things of that nature to be responsible when, when drinking. Um, yes, yes, um, yeah. So as people, I think, to some extent are getting away from um, beverages that have alcohol in there uh, to begin with because there are people that, uh, need to avoid alcohol whatsoever. Uh, so uh, being aware, even making your own drink, so that you have an increased awareness of um, what's going in there. There's a big difference between uh, one and two shots, particularly for um, a smaller woman that um, mm -hmm. where weight is going to uh, play into a factor as how how you're metabolizing the alcohol. Um, drinking um, with food can curb the effect of alcohol um, as far, because it's going to slow down the absorption, absorption of the alcohol. So um, that's another consideration. Um, beer can fact on a lot of these craft and IPA beers that are very trendy uh, can uh, be like eating a Snickers bar truly. Uh, you can have a ultra light beer for 60 calories, or um, you could have a uh, some uh, higher calorie IPA for about 230 calories. Um, saving those couple uh, hundred calories, even 200 calories in one day is equivalent to a half a pound of weight gain in a week. And when you consider the entire holiday season, these small changes can make a difference. Uh, a dry, glass of dry wine uh, is only about 800 calories also. So that could be another good choice, especially uh, if it's set. You want to consider also the rate at which you drink a drink. So it may be quite easy to put down um, a shot in a matter of seconds. Uh, whereas uh, if you're sipping on a glass of wine, um, it can uh, last throughout a meal. Uh, Another tip is to interject uh, a, a non-alcoholic drink in between uh, drinking. So uh, you may even start out with a sparkling glass of water. You may have one glass of wine, have another glass of sparkling water, maybe end your dinner with a cup of tea or decaffeinated coffee, uh, and then uh, maybe consider another glass of wine later in the evening. So disperse, delay, uh, are a couple techniques to minimize the alcohol. And holiday season seems to be a really hectic time for shopping. Um, can you tell us some grocery shopping tips and tricks for this holiday season? Well, it can absolutely be hectic, and especially uh, with uh, limitations in stores and lines. But you really want to strategize, find out what those busiest hours are. Uh, and that information is available if you uh, on Google uh, quite often. They'll show you when the busiest hours are. Uh, so uh, planning that uh, accordingly uh, and just really going with a list. And I, I say this over and over, do not go hungry because everything in the store is going to look appealing. And... Uh, Billions of dollars I spend on marketing food products. Uh, so you definitely don't, you want to go with some defense and prepared uh, for that. So go with your list. Uh, no, don't avoid, try to avoid buying large quantities of things. If you are buying one of those accessories for uh, a special occasion or a meal, uh, buy a small amount of that uh quantity of food. For example, if you're making a cookie with dark chocolate chips, don't buy the giant bag at the wholesale store uh, because those extras, uh, we know what's going to happen with those. They're too easy to stuff, pop in your mouth. <laughs> so keeping a clean food environment as much as possible is important. Also, don't uh, end caps are going to be filled with uh, tempting foods, maybe less healthy foods. Uh, and, and uh, even ones that will sound healthy, it doesn't pumpkin sound like a, a healthy uh, vegetable for everybody or um, dark chocolate. 
well, yes, a small amount of dark chocolate can be healthy, but many of the dark chocolates out there aren't more than uh, 50 percent chocolate. They they really don't have much chocolate at all, and they have a lot of sugar in them. Um, something may uh, be made with sweet potatoes, uh, which again sounds pretty healthy, but when you examine the ingredients and the sugar content, uh, it's more sugar than sweet potatoes. So uh, you want to be a, kind of like a PI uh, going into the store. Uh, again, the time to practice is not in the uh, moment of panic, but practice label reading. Uh, there's a great app called Fujicate where um, you just, uh, it's very, it has a very good visual display. It's uh, it's been won awards for the for one of the best apps, and even kids can use it. Where you scan food items, the barcode it brings up a picture, and it will rate it from an A to an F, uh, which is a very quick way to determine if a, the food's health value based on an algorithm that considers many different factors. Uh, makes label reading easy. And then not only that will give you foods that rate higher on the scale. So you're not looking necessarily for the optimal diet. It just doesn't exist out there. But how, how can I make this a bit healthier on the continuum? Great. Now, um, if we're trying as family and friends to make healthier choices um, this season, how can we support each other? And then part two to this question, what is the best way to make our friends uh, and family respect our food choices? Yeah, so that can be a, probably one of the number one challenges um, uh, because of all the different family dynamics. And I, I think the best place to start is to actually just ask that question. Um, so many people have different needs right now. Uh, my 88-year-old mother uh, continuously will say, I remember the day when I would serve a ham and potato salad and everybody would be happy. Um, <laughs> but because of advances in uh, nutrition, people have more specific requests, specific needs, whether they need to be watching their salt, their cholesterol, gluten-free, uh, whatever it may be. Um, I can go on and on. So we need to uh, be respectful of that. Also, people's uh, religious beliefs are going to affect their food choices, their cultural beliefs. So it's important to ask other people about uh, their food preferences and not impose our own values upon them. Uh, it's um, also important to set to boundaries, healthy boundaries. Um, only you have control of what you put into your body. And um, that's something uh, that needs to be respected. Uh, so letting other people know if you have special needs or uh, that uh, a special plan that you're following um, is important. And it's important to pose it in a positive way also because there's a big difference between saying that um oh yes i i'm making these food choices because they feel energy i feel so much more energetic and i'm going to sleep well tonight so i can uh, play uh tag football tomorrow um with the kids versus yes my mom have to eat this for me, um, you're, then you're the Debbie Downer, and everybody's going to actually, with all good intentions, try want to try to make you to feel better, um, and maybe say uh, deter you actually from your goal uh, in doing so by saying, "Oh, it just doesn't matter this time. You know, go ahead, eat what you want." So the way you present. Um, yourself to others and and um, those food decisions is going to make a big difference. Um, also, um, and the part of the host, don't be a control freak. Uh, so allow people to uh, participate, to uh, delegate even um, to other people, to give them the opportunity to bring the foods that are consistent with how they eat. Uh, and the guest portion, offer to bring something. So 
uh, and find out what they're having um, so you can uh, make it work with their theme. Uh, so if uh, you have, for example, everything seems to be rich and fatty um, in the appetizer area, you can offer to bring some um, uh, a vegetable uh, tray, uh, some uh, cold shrimp um, or something to offset all the uh, cheesy, rich appetizers. Excellent. Uh, filling your plate up too is really important. So if people see you participating in the meal, they're going to leave you alone uh, <laughs> uh, to a great extent. So fill your plate up with a lot of um, vegetables. So things, foods that don't have a lot of calories and just take a small amount of other foods. Um, and, and don't use this as a time to be you know, dogmatic and um, uh, you know, try to convert the world as far as your uh, healthy eating habits. Uh, you may uh, choose to uh, please somebody by taking a small amount of a, a dish that they take pride in and, and having a couple mindful tastes of that and um, relaying your great pleasure in, um, in, in savoring that small amount of food. Uh, prepare yourself too with ways out. Um, boy, my eyes are just bigger than my stomach. This was great food, um, and I, I will so much more appreciate it. You know, tomorrow, can I please take this the rest of this home? Um, some people are not food wasters, and it's a great insult if, to leave food on the plate. So think of your uh, uh, audience, who you're going to be around, and uh, some uh, ways out, if you want to say, um, that, that can be lifesavers. Or I'm going to, I, you know, I have to go to this other event, uh, so I have to be cautious and uh, just really enjoy a little bit of these scrumptious foods. So uh, prepare yourself ahead of time. Great. And we cannot talk about the holiday season without talking about New Year's. So for those thinking about a New Year's resolution starting the new year, um, what do you say to them? So many resolutions fall short. How do we stay on track? Um, yes, first of all, don't punish yourself uh, and shame yourself for maybe some of the negative uh, decisions you made during the holiday season. Um, because too many people do that, that, oh boy, I gained five pounds. I um, I ate all this sugar, I, oh, shame on me, shame on me. And th that's not going to get you very far. You know, that just can get you in a vicious cycle of uh, defeat. Uh, so um, make a decision to, you know, to start off fresh. And uh, be, a good way of thinking about it is not to set a uh, weight goal. Weight is going to be an outcome of healthy behaviors. Um, so determine uh, what could, how you could eat healthier. What is something that uh, is a realistic change that I can make um, and focus on the positive. So it might be, all right, I really haven't been eating as many vegetables as I want. They've been replaced by some of these heavier winter foods. So I'm going to aim to have uh, a good portion of vegetables that will uh, lunch and dinner, uh, you know, five days a week. Um, that's something that could be a very realistic goal, a positive goal, um, a non-deprivational goal uh, that's um, manageable. Also, uh, think of uh, skills that you may want to develop. Um, perhaps you are a meat eater and you think about well why well this has just been tradition or i hear it all the time my wife doesn't want to smell the house with fish or i just don't know how to cook fish whenever i make it it comes out dry and nasty so i might be learning a new skill i'm going to take a cooking class and learn some uh cooking techniques so i can make good fish or i'm going to look up a youtube uh recipe and uh, you know follow the chef um, once a week and make a new fish recipe uh, for the next month. So um, focusing on developing skills and practicing those skills and reinforcing them uh, in an incremental manner, a strategic manner, is the best way to reach your ultimate goal of eating healthier, weight loss, or whatever it may be. 
Sure. Great. Well, Maxine has been very informative. Thank you again for being here with us today. Is there anything you'd like to conclude with? Just, uh, yeah, don't, don't be too tough on yourself uh, this holiday season. It can be tough, especially this season with all the changes and maybe doing things differently. Uh, so continue some of those traditions, which can bring both comfort, uh, it can uh, soothe, be soothing, connect you with the past, uh, but also uh, don't be afraid to think out of the box. And, uh, you know, what, what is purely uh, tradition, just for tradition's sake, what can I tweak a little bit to make it a bit healthier and uh, make it create a new uh, experience, a new tradition? Thank you. Thank you so much, Maxine, for this interview. And for our viewers and listeners, if you'd like to schedule an appointment with a Cleveland Clinic registered dietitian, you can call 216-444-3046. And to listen to more podcasts with our Cleveland Clinic experts, you can visit clevelandclinic.org slash HE podcast or subscribe wherever you get your own podcasts. And for more health tips, news, and information, make sure you follow us on Cleveland Clinic Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you so much for tuning in.